and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Today, we will be delving deep into practical farm research, and it is my pleasure to welcome not one, but two great guests with experience in the topic. These are Jim Schwartz, Director of Research, Agronomy and PFR at Bex Hybrids, and Jason Geheimer, PFR Manager at Bex. Welcome. Great to be here, Anna. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jim and Jason. Um, I, I've, I've warned you, we like to start out of left field at this podcast. So um, I was wondering, what's something your colleagues might not know about you? And Jim, why don't you start us off? Uh, I will. I have a pretty unique icebreaker in that way. Most of my colleagues do not know that a long time ago, I was shot by the daughter of a Boston mob boss. How's that for an icebreaker for Whoa. you? So that is a true story. Uh, there's a lot of details into it. We were actually hunting. Uh, and uh, it's a friend of mine from, from college. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, she actually shot me with a shotgun accidentally. No harm, no foul. But that's, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, that's my icebreaker for you, Anna. Well, way to start us off with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, it's not a competition, but Jason, I mean, <laughs> how that about you? Uh, that one's it's tough to follow that one, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go into it with a, also another hunting story. So I've I've also uh, had a, a hunting incident where I've been actually attacked by a live coyote. So uh, that was a what? pretty unique experience. <laughs> I, I shot a coyote, thought it was uh, dead and went up to it, you know, poked it like you're supposed to. And it just stood right up and came after me. So. That was oh, a that was wow. a good time. Wow, you certainly live interesting lives. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that changed the best practice on what you're supposed to do after you shot a uh, coyote. <laughs> like you're not maybe don't poke them, maybe look at them for a little while and see if they move. Wow. Okay. Uh this is <laughs> trying to maybe we, we hunt for more detail on practical farm <laughs> research now. Um Very nice. uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um so so I mean, we've mentioned it a couple of times now, Practical Farm Research Program, PFR. What is it? What For those who don't know, Jim, why don't you start us off? So it started in 1964 when Sonny Beck came back to the business from college. He had just completed his master's degree. And he felt as though funding, government funding for university research, third party unbiased research, those land grant institutions were not going to continue to receive that necessary funding. Mm -hmm. And he felt like somebody was going to need to step in and fill the vacuum uh, to help create information to help farmers succeed that really wasn't biased, didn't take an, a, a viewpoint from the beginning. Uh, there are a lot of folks who do research, but they obviously are trying to prove their product works. So that's when he started the program many years ago to say, how can we create a research program uh, that does not really focus on Beck's products? It just focuses on agronomic practices, equipment, any kind of research that a farmer might be interested in that perhaps uh, used to be done by land grant institutions here in the States, but isn't being funded anymore. Mm. There are a couple of key things that I'd like to jump in on uh, there. Um, you say it can be any kind of product and maybe not just the first thing you think of. So so can you give us maybe an idea of the range that you're covering? It's a very and, and I should have said products and practices. Um, we will we'll test biological products. We'll test equipment. We'll t uh, we're testing equipment from John Deere there. They have two new pieces of equipment. Uh, exact shot. Uh, we will test fertilizer systems, uh, desiccant studies, will create machines to test what's the impact of hail or frost or uh, wind damage, you name it. If it's anything that impacts a farmer in his operation and or it's some emerging technology or product that a farmer might be interested in learning about, we'll test mm -hmm. it. Uh, in my research for for our uh, interview today, I saw that you uh, in an interview with Hoosiers today, I think it was, um, said you or you said we get our best ideas from growers. <laughs> so how how does that work? How do you actually like go from your interest and what you think might be interesting to farmers to growers uh, to turning turning it around, having them input you? Yeah, Jason, you spend a lot of time uh, accumulating those thoughts and ideas. You mind sharing how you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So we, I mean, all year long when we're, when we're hosting events or just going out and 
meeting with farmers, dealers, uh, our sales force, we're, we're asking those questions, right? What, what questions do they have? What problems do they have on their farm? I mean, that's the, that's the biggest one. When guys start talking about, you know, what, what problems they have, we start thinking about, okay, how can we design a study around that to find a solution for that problem? Goes back to kind of what Jim said with things like hail, like, okay, what, what can a farmer do anything at all, or just walk away from it and come back and it is what it is. So, um, so just getting feedback from, from growers all year long, and, you know, we ask our sales uh, force and our agronomy teams to be mm. very involved in what we do. And so, you know, we solicit some feedback from them and then we kind of take everything and uh, we get a lot of companies that also contact us all the time, uh, having interest in, in us looking at their products or equipment within practical farm research. So we, you know, we have all those things and we have a committee that sits down in November, December, early January and really kind of filters through everything and starts designing mm-hmm. protocols. And I'll give you a great of, example, Adam. We, in, we have a lot of meetings, have a lot of conversations with growers. And over the last few years, been a very high level of interest in products that are biological nitrogen fixing products in corn. There's a number of those products on the market, many more emerging. And when we heard, when, when customers and farmers started asking us, do you have any research on that topic, for instance, we get together and go probably ought to start doing some research on biological nitrogen fixing products in corn. So it's really, it's very organic where we get a lot of our ideas. They come from the field and then we say, well, something farmers are interested in, let's learn Mm -hmm. a little bit more. That's a, that's a great process. So uh, you, you said your committee uh, gets together kind of in October, November. So uh, how do you collect throughout the year? And then that's where it's decided. Or do you have maybe a secondary system, different, several committee meetings, uh, Jason? Yeah, so we, we start. So our, our book, we get that off to the printer, usually around November 7th through the 10th. And so that kind of finishes the year for for practical farm research and we immediately start thinking about next year. So we will we will start mid-November and we will have these committee meetings about once a week all the way through mid-January because or end of January because first week of February is when we have our protocols 100% complete. We know what we're doing. And then we have to get everything ready at the site levels, all the different locations that we have, figure out which studies are go which locations, get everything organized, get stuff ordered. And just get get everything ready to to hit the field by you know at least by April first, if not earlier, at some of these locations. So it's a it's a it's a lengthy process, and there's there's just there's a lot there is a lot of things that get thrown our way. There's a lot of companies that want us to consider their mm. their products, and you know we can't add. We unfortunately we typically say no to more stuff than we have, we are able to say yes to. Um, so we could be very we can be very selective on what we what we feel like we should be testing for the farmer. It's not a it's not a pay to play. We're not a third party contract researcher. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're very unique in the fact that it is extremely hard to find 100 percent unbiased, replicated agronomic research. And we're one of those very few sources where a farmer can turn to. And we're testing things that and showing the results no matter what happens. The companies do not get to see the data and approve the data prior to its publication. That's something Mm. we meet with these companies. We talk through the process. And there's honestly, there's some companies that aren't okay with that. And we don't we don't want to go down that path that they need to probably be more comfortable paying a third party research company to get their their data where. You know, the ones that are are confident in their product or just okay with how we handle things. Um, you know, those are the ones that we will keep within the program if if we can. So it's very unique mm. in the fact that, you know, like I said, no, no money ever changes hands. We are 100 percent unbiased. Um, if a product works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We try to explain best we can if mm-hmm. it did work, why or if it didn't work, why we think it didn't work. You know, no product works every time. No practice works every time. Um, so we try to find some of the more consistent things and push those through to our program. Yeah, it's something that struck me when uh, I think it was in the video on on PFR, uh, you were quoted as saying, we have a commitment to our farmers that we have to be unique, we have to be fresh, and we have a responsibility to bring new technology and to explain to growers what it is. Um, That to me was really interesting because it seemed to transport that you're really looking to kind of 
go to the edge, like get the edge to the farmers uh, to make a difference there. Um, and also to have a focus on explaining, not just, you know, putting a few results out there, but really um, helping the farmers, the growers understand how to implement them. Um, and you've mentioned the book too. So uh, that's another thing for people who do not know, I'm sure in our uh, listeners, there aren't that many who haven't heard of the PFR book, but can you maybe sketch out what is that product that you put out there? Go ahead, Jason. Explain a little bit about the the book. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're that's what we're working on now. We actually start working on that in usually late July, early August. Just all the prep work that goes into it, because uh, combines start rolling, you know, over here at most of our locations around the second week of September. And so we have to have all the all the plots have to be harvested by the end of October as we send that, you know, the, all the data to the printer there, you know, the first or second week of November. So it's a, it's a really quick turnaround time in which we have to harvest and work the data and just, just get everything ready, mm -hmm. and get our marketing team to, to, you know, graphically design everything. But uh, the PFR books right now, it's 296 pages of hundred percent agronomic based research that we, we conduct. And so the, the kind of the beginning of the book is what we call PFR proven. So it's a mm -hmm. it's a new concept we started four or five years ago. And really the the idea behind it was we had a lot of good products in the past that we had tested and they kind of get they had getting they were getting forgot about, right? They, there were times mm -hmm. that that somebody would say, Hey, have you ever tested this? It's like, Yeah, yeah, we have, and it did really well. And they're like, Oh, that'd be interesting to see that data. <laughs> and so, you know, we test so much stuff every year that we wanted to make sure kind of the best of the best of what we've tested over time stayed fresh. Mm -hmm. Um, and we still showed that in some manner. So we came up with what we call PFR proven. And that is any product or practice that we have tested for a minimum of three years at multiple locations. And it has to, the multi-location data set every time, every year has to uh, give a positive yield gain. And then the return on investment has to average a positive ROI. So it could have one year where you know, maybe it only gained a bushel, but the ROI was a little bit negative. As long as the three-year average ROI is positive and the gains yield every single year in that multi-location data set, it becomes what we call PFR proven. And so that product or practice then uh -huh. comes to the top. And when we talk about PFR proven, it's that's where we, we tell growers, hey, if you want to try something new on your farm, look through PFR proven, find something that you can mm. easily implement that's not going to cost you a lot of money and time because those products and practices not that they're going to work every single time, but they have the highest chance of giving you an ROI. Right. Well, that, that also means, if I if I infer correctly, that you keep testing those uh, PFR proven products and practices. So uh, to keep with that average, you would have to keep field testing those particular products. Is that correct? Well, so we do them for three. Sometimes we'll do it's a minimum of three years, right? So if we decide uh, that you know we we need some more data on whatever this is, right? If it has to do with nitrogen, a lot of times we'll do few more years because mother nature and weather patterns dictate a lot of things when it comes to nitrogen and those type of things. So um, it just depends. And there's some things we test for three years and that's, we, that's enough data. We're good with it. And, and we stop there. So that's, that's another benefit of no money changing hands. There's no obligations. Mm -hmm. We decide what we want to test. We decide how long we want to test it. If we test a product one year and it doesn't do very well, it doesn't mean it's a bad product, but you know, we may we may move forward with other things that we want to look at and not test that for year two. So there's never a never a longevity commitment on how long we're going to test somebody's product. Or um, like I said, that's the only investment companies have when we test their products. It's just ensuring that we get products sent to our locations in time mm -hmm. for the trials. Right. So we ask them to send us product by April 1st and we request those products early March. So there's plenty of time and it's only two, three, four acres worth of product to every location. Um, so there's there's really no investment in the companies to be part of our program. Um, but at the end of but the day, potentially a great return, right? <laughs> great could be could be great return, could be not so great return. Right. It's risk reward right there for them. So, um, well, I, I would know, argue that even even if like if it was a bad result, like, you know, as a first instance, it's still valuable because you have great independent uh, results and, you know, you got to work on your product. Otherwise, it's not going to not going to stay on the market for very long, is it? Yeah. Yeah. And usually, I, you know, I, I agree with you on that because like I go back to the the part of we're very selective on what we can because mm. we get so many things. We can be selective on what we want to put in the program versus not. So a lot of times we do probably test things that have a higher chance of, of success just because we, we can be picky on what we bring in the program. If one company has if two companies have similar products, but one has a lot 
They've got a lot more third party data already on their product. We've heard good things about their product, whether that's out in the field from growers or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. we're probably going to bring that one forward versus the other one that maybe they're just it's brand new. We haven't heard anything with it on it or there isn't a lot of results yet with it. So mm-hmm. um, so a lot of times we have a there's probably a higher success rate with a lot of the stuff we test just because we are very, very selective and we, as we can be with what we bring in the program. We want to try to find things that um, can help farmers succeed. There, I will also say, though, Anna, there are, you know, we, we have a lot of studies. We'll look at them and go, well, you know, the weather is changing. Uh, it's probably a good idea not to just accept our assumptions that we tested four or five or six years ago. So oftentimes we will reinitiate a study because we think, oh, maybe the weather is changing how it impacts the, those results. We also have studies Uh, We have seed treatment studies that have run 17 years. We have the longest running tillage and rotation study in the state of Indiana. Uh, Mm -hmm. So there are studies that are very planting date studies. Uh, We believe that hybrids and varieties change in relation to planting dates. We've done those for 20 plus years and we'll continue to do those kinds of studies as well. So some are short term, some are longer term studies. But the other thing is you mentioned the book and we we print and mail close to 60,000 of those books out for free to growers. So if a product works, it's really good. And if a product doesn't work, uh, it can be it can be pretty damaging for a company if it doesn't work. And so that's the hesitancy that Jason mentioned. Uh, Mm -hmm. You're exposed if your product doesn't work. Now, to Jason's point, we always try to explain Here's why we think we see the results. When we live and operate in a biological world impacted by the weather and environment, you know, I've always said it's probably more surprising to me when a product is consistent than when it's not. But we always try to explain the why, because that, frankly, most growers out there would tell you, I just want to know why. Tell me why something might work or why something might not work. And they're accepting of that uh, to a certain degree. Yeah, that makes total sense. You've mentioned so many examples now um, and quite a big range, too. How many studies do you have going uh, in any given year? Jason, share a little bit about break it out by crop and um, and share with their maybe even by location, what an average location might look like. Yeah. Yeah. So on average, every year we have around just a little over 100 different studies total. Um, so that's 100 different actual protocols, different studies. Um, usually there's a, it's about a 60 40 ratio, 60 percent are corn studies, 40 percent are soybeans. It just seems like there's always a few more things on corn that trip our trigger, I guess, than, than what on soybeans. So, um, so a little heavy on, on corn there. We also do corn silage research. We're going to be dabbling into some other crops like potentially sorghum research and some of those things here in the future as well, but predominantly corn soybeans. We also have a decent amount of replicated data on wheat over the years as well. So, um, but we also have right now, we've got seven, uh, PFR locations where we do this research. So out of all those a hundred, 90% 90% of them are multi-location, right? There are a mm-hmm. few site-specific studies that are only at one location, um, but we have most of our studies are replicated at three to five different locations. And so right now we have seven and we're getting ready to open two more in the course of the next two years. So we'll be at, we'll be at nine and then, you know, we'll continue to grow from there probably. So we've, we've really, we've really ramped up not only what we do in practical farm research, but where we do it. Mm-hmm. I was about to say that because I, I think I'd read six. So I was like, oh, seven, there's one more now. <laughs> it's growing. And I guess it makes sense with this many uh, products and, and practices to test. It, it is. And we also, so we try to represent geographically the area in which we market, but we're very careful to represent different soil types, uh, different mm. growing environments. So we're pretty cognizant of how and where we test so that we're representing the broadest swath of growing conditions, environments, soil types. And then you'll see oftentimes we'll we'll aggregate our data in such a way to say, okay, here's maybe some of the prairie soils or look at the data on the poorly drained soils. So that's, we're very, very careful as we select our sites and our locations and our geography to make sure we're balancing all those parameters out to the best of our ability. 
Well, what are those sites? I mean, I I saw the book a little bit. I saw uh, uh, Kentucky, I think, Illinois, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Maybe give us a quick overview. Where where can we find those sites? Sure. So starting in the east, we have one in London, Ohio. So South Central Ohio, Henderson, Kentucky, which is Northwest Kentucky here in Atlanta, Indiana. We mm -hmm. have two in Illinois, one at Effingham and one at El Paso. So the Effingham location to what I previously discussed, that's more of a heavy, poorly drained clay soil. The El Paso location is very much a high organic matter, well-drained prairie soil. We also have a location in Colfax, Iowa. We have a, a newly opened location this past August in Goner, Nebraska. So east central Nebraska, kind of right on the border of where you would irrigate and not irrigate. We have a location in Gibbon, Minnesota. We are building a new one in Olivia, Minnesota. And then we're also in the process of building a new one in uh, Salina, Kansas. Then we also have a couple locations that we call them cooperator locations. We have close relationships with folks that we trust to uh, operate and to affect our protocols correctly. And so we have a location in Wisconsin, one in the Delta. Uh, so down in the Delta of the United States. So those are locations we'll utilize. They're smaller. They, they're not staffed by Bex personnel, but uh, mm -hmm. those are all different. Look, and then again, we'll continue to look at other locations. Say, if we don't have anything in Michigan. Is there an opportunity in Michigan? And we'll look at all those opportunities. But yeah, seven seven Beck owned sites. Two more coming online, and then a couple cooperator locations as well. So it gives us a broad footprint. Eventually, that we'll probably end up around ten, but it could be more. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like there's a, a lot of interest. You've mentioned a couple of times how, how hard it is to select or how selective you are and have to be in your work. I'm also thinking of a quote again from one of the videos I watched before this interview. Um, one of your colleagues said, uh, I get to work for a place where the extent to which you can influence farmers' livelihood is really only limited by your imagination. And that really struck me. I was like, yeah, you got to be, it's it's about taking input, but also you got to be creative. How do you design a study to really you know, get the results that you need to create impactful results for farmers to succeed. And also focusing on livelihood, I, I feel like is different than just saying like, okay, let's let's try and make the crops more effective, right? It's It has a bigger view. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Here recently, we sat down and we said, there, there are a lot of decisions that growers make in season. Um, we've not really sat down and said, let's be very intentional about thinking about the things that impact a grower during the growing season. And then how might he react to those? Those are things that folks, you know, you think about a lot of the research, oh, it'll be soil fertility research, or it'll be equipment research. And that's all, that's all well and good. Where the rubber hits the road for a lot of growers is I've just experienced a hailstorm. What do I do? Do I, do I spray a fungicide? Do I, added an additional foliar nutritional product to help me out. Oh my goodness, I just experienced a frost. Um, mm. Should I mow that crop off? Should I replant? I have a thin stand of beans. What do I do? Do I fill it in? Do I tear it up? We have to be, to your point, the, the nice thing about Bex, I would say, is that many, many, many of the folks that work here farm, okay? They farm mm. on their own. They have their own small farms. So they live it daily. And that daily experience of working on a farm also allows them to think creatively about, and knowing what we do, they'll go, man, I wonder what happens if X happens during the growing season, how might we react to improve the outcome? That would be a great PFR study. Mm. Um, so that the <laughs> fact that a lot of our folks understand that dynamic, it allows them to think very creative. I can tell you, Anna, Jason is probably very scared to come into my office because I have a whiteboard and my whiteboard <laughs> has this long list of crazy ideas. Every And I'll be thinking or have a conversation, I'll get up and write an idea on my whiteboard. A lot of them are really crazy ideas, but that's the fun of it to say, how do we think differently about what's going on on anyone's individual farm to d design or create a study that people haven't thought of before that will help them succeed. That's really our job in the end. Our job is to help a farmer succeed. Our job is not, and, and that's Sonny Beck's directive to us as well, is to say, don't worry about whether or not what you do helps sell seed. What I want you to worry about is whether or not what you do helps a farmer succeed. I have one last question to both of you, but I feel like we you've already started to answer it is, um, what do you love most about your job? Jason, I'm going to th throw it to you first. 
<laughs> I love this question. We get this all the time. Uh, mm. It's the it's the culture. It's the freedom to operate at Bex. Jim hit on a little bit with, you know, when we make when we make decisions, the first filter we go through is, will this help a farmer succeed? It's not how does this impact Bex's bottom line? Is this in the budget? Is it's not the very first filter when we make decisions, especially in practical farm research. That filters does this help a farmer succeed? If the answer is yes, we typically do it and figure out how to make it work, right? Mm. No matter what that takes. And so it's the freedom to operate, the freedom to to do all these things to help farmers succeed and just work with great people all the time, coming to work, not feeling like it is work, enjoying what you do. Um, it's it's different at Bex. And anybody that that has been around Bex or knows Bex a little bit, they they that statement is real. The culture here and how we how we treat employees, the you know the Beck family look at us as the Beck family of employees, um, mm. not just numbers. So it's it's refreshing to come to a place that you know care about each and every one of us, and you know through thick and thin have our back. So yeah, I would I echo the echo those comments. One of the things that I really enjoy is uh, the ability to be authentic here and be who you are, and you don't you don't have to act like someone you're not or pretend to be something you're not. The ability to think very creatively and differently. I, Anna, when I wake up in the morning, I sit there and go, what can I do today that might help a farmer succeed? Part of what's very important for the Beck family, uh, and, and frankly, part of what attracts us to working with companies like Computomics, is our ability to remain independent, to have the scale and scope, to do the things that uh, give us the leverage as we negotiate with our partners, but also to maintain an independent company that is focused on the farmer. Um, in this era of consolidation, heck, every era goes through consolidation, but there, there's a lot of large scale consolidation. The Beck, as you can imagine, the Beck family has been approached many, many times about selling, and they have no interest in that because they feel so strongly that someone or some entity has to be there focused on the farmer. And that's frankly, a big reason why practical farm research exists and will continue to exist in the future. I feel like we started this podcast with two bangs and we finished it with two bangs. Um, thank you so much, you two, for your time, for giving us such a great insight into your work, uh, into your motivations. And we will obviously uh, link to PFR um, to some info in the show notes. And yeah, I hope to have you back sometime, maybe in the future and talk. Uh, once you've had that 10th location, maybe we can talk some more. We'd love it. Thank you very much for having us, Anna. We really appreciate it. Thank you for listening in today. Want to learn more? Then check out our show notes and more info on Computomics.com. If you have questions or want to propose a next guest, please reach out to us at podcast at Computomics.com. 